Right, if you have a Bible with you, please turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Last week, when we were in um, John 11, we saw the story of how Jesus Christ raised Lazarus from the dead. We saw the story of Lazarus being raised from death to life and having the the grave clothes taken off him once he'd walked out of the tomb. And the main point of last week's sermon was taking a look at the bigger picture, the bigger plan, seeing how the Bible teaches God knows the end from the beginning, and how when Lazarus was first made ill, they sent a letter to Jesus saying, quickly, come, come, come. And Jesus said, I love him so much that I'm going to wait until he's dead to make my way to him. And to us as people, we were like, what? How, how would Jesus be loving someone so much by waiting purposefully until he had died? And we saw the bigger picture that through Lazarus's, Lazarus's resurrection, it was going to bless not only Lazarus, it was going to bless Martha, Mary, the family, and a whole entire multitude of people would believe in Jesus because of what happened with Lazarus that day. So last week was very much about the bigger picture. And today, the bigger picture continues with a story pretty much continuing continuing on from that moment, maybe a few weeks or months afterwards, but it's continuing on. So we're going to get straight into it today. I'm going to pray for us first, and then we'll start with verse 1 of chapter 12. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I, I truly believe that there are aspects of this sermon today that are some of the most crucial and important I will ever preach at a pulpit in my entire ministry so unbelievably woven into the gospel, so unbelievably crucial for salvation, and yet, Lord, in so many instances, undertaught, underappreciated, undermentioned. Lord, I pray that you would please help me today, Lord. Please fill me with your love, with your guidance, with your wisdom, with your words, Lord. Please help, help Aaron, Lord, to take a back seat, and may you please take the steering wheel, Lord, during this sermon. Please take over, Heavenly Father. I submit everything to, to you. I submit my mouth to you, my body. I submit my soul, my heart, my mind to you. And I pray that my brothers and sisters would do the same, Lord, as we gather here to hear from you, Lord God. Please speak to your people. Speak to those who have come today who are not yet your people. But may they leave today knowing that something has truly spoken into their lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. John 12, verse 1. Follow with me. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. So going back to verse 1, it tells us that Jesus is going to Bethany to share a meal with Lazarus in their household, and it tells us specifically that it's six days before the Passover. Now, what's quite incredible about this is we are in John chapter 12 right now, and there's 21 chapters, but for the rest of the Gospel of John, for nearly half of the Gospel, it's only going to focus on the last week of Jesus' ministry. All the other chapters from this point onwards are all in this last week. Because believe it or not, when it says six days before the Passover, that's the same Passover where Jesus will be crucified. So the rest of the Gospel of John is going to focus on one week of the three-year ministry of Jesus. Under, just under 50% of John is all about the last week. In the Gospel of Mark, 40% of the Gospel is about the last week. In the Gospel of Matthew, 33% of the Gospel is about the last week. And in the book of Luke, 25% of that Gospel is all about the last week of Jesus. So here Jesus is, in the last week of his earthly ministry, 
having a fellowship meal with Lazarus and his family just before he enters in Jerusalem and the hour comes for him to be crucified. It's not a coincidence that the four Gospels have such huge chunks of the books focused just on that last week. I think the Bible might be trying to tell us something. (laughs) That last week is pretty important in the story of Jesus' ministry. So it says that when they gave a dinner for him there, Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Lazarus had just been raised from the dead. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, it would be customary in Jewish households that when you came round for dinner, they would wash your feet, they'd wash the feet of guests, and they would anoint the head of a guest with a little bit of oil. They would anoint their head, wash their feet, and then welcome into, into the house. But several very unusual things were happening here. First of all, they didn't anoint the head of Jesus, they anointed the feet. Second of all, something that was very culturally not inappropriate, but something not something that would normally be done, is Mary let down her hair. When in public or when with guests, for Jewish women, they would never have their hair free-flowing how we do now. It was seen as quite dishonorable. So for her to have her hair just free-flowing and then to use it to wash someone's feet, Culturally, culturally for the time, this would have been a very strange ordeal going on in this room. What is happening? Why did you not anoint his head? But Mary here is showing us the pure devotion, love and humility she had towards Christ. She was not worthy to anoint his head, so she anointed his feet. And her hair mattered nothing to her to use it to wipe the oil into, her, in, into his feet. It didn't mean anything for her to do something that could be seen as so degrading as long as it was being done for the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's quite incredible to see her devotion and her love, but, it, but I want you to understand that for us this would be a strange scene. It was even a strange scene for the other Jews of the time. This would have been something like, what is going on? Why is she doing that? That isn't normal practice. That isn't what we normally do. Look what happens next. It says, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, the ointment that Mary used was about a year's worth of wages in that time. A year. 12 months worth of wages was about how much that ointment would have cost. 300 denarii was an average uh, year's wage of a Jewish working man back in that time. So this was, you know, off the offset, it looks like Judas makes a very good point. What a waste. A year's wages on someone's feet? That could be used for so so many other better purposes like this and like that. But obviously, as we can see, Judas's heart was not in the right place, neither was he genuine in his desire. But I want to point out to you something that's very interesting. In the Gospel of Matthew, it tells us, it might be Matthew or Mark, but in one of them, it tells us that it was the disciples who disagreed with Mary. It doesn't say Judas. It says the disciples grew indignant with Mary. Do you know what that tells us? That tells us that the disciples were led in that moment by the words of Judas. John tells us who started it. The other Gospels tell us the disciples carried on and and joined in. A warning to us all. Be very careful. Be very careful about the pretense of holiness. The pretense of righteousness. The pretense of good works. Judas, from a wicked heart, said, shouldn't we be helping the poor? And the other disciples said, yeah, you're right, Judas, we should be helping the poor. Mary, what you're doing is wrong. But look what the Bible says about the heart of Judas. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Now, the first thing I'm going to give you, I'm not going to speculate for any, any of the rest of this chapter, but I'm just going to give you one speculation for you to weigh and test. And the speculation is, it doesn't tell us who put Judas in charge of the money bag, does it? All it tells us is that Judas was a thief, 
that he evidently loved money because he stole it out of the money bag. And so my conjecture that I can't prove and is purely a speculation is I believe that Judas put himself in charge of the money bag. Be aware when people put themselves in positions, when people desire positions for a certain reason, it might just reveal to you what is going on with their heart. What's very interesting is irregardless of whether it was given to him or whether he chose it, Jesus knew about it the entire time. There wouldn't have been one second that Jesus didn't know what Judas was doing in that money bag throughout that ministry. He didn't care about the poor, he cared about money. He was a thief from the beginning. Judas is a very interesting character in the Bible, and the reason he's interesting is because he brings to Christians a great problem. And the great problem is this. How is it that the Bible can name him among the disciples? How is it that he was even allotted his share in the ministry of an apostle, but he was a thief? From the very start, he was never following Jesus because he loved Jesus. He was following Jesus because he loved money, and it was a good way to get money. I've told you before that nowhere in the Gospels will you find the beginning of Jude Judas's and Jesus's relationship. We know from the Bible that Judas came from a town very near to where Jesus was, was raised. We know that from the Bible, but we don't know how Judas met Jesus or how Jesus met Judas, the only disciple we don't know the origins of. But what we do know is what's said in John 17 when Jesus is praying to the Father. He says this about Judas. When he's talking about the disciples, he says, Lord, I, Father, I kept them in your name which you have given me. I have guarded them and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction. Jesus himself, when praying to the Father, refers to Judas as the son of destruction. And he says that the scriptures might be fulfilled. In John 6, 70, Jesus says to the twelve, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet, one of you is a devil. Jesus turns around to the twelve apostles and said, Did I not choose you? And yet, one of you is a devil. Jesus knew from the beginning. Peter takes it further when explaining the origins of Judas in the book of Acts. He says, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all of his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akadema, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. Peter here is quoting Psalm 69 and Psalm 108. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Judas was born, King David was prophesying as to what Judas would do to Jesus. He was prophesying about how Judas would betray him, and he prophesies in such detail that he tells us the field that Judas would buy with the 30 silver coins. Hundreds of years before he was born. Now, this brings up for us a difficult question, and the question often comes down to, well then, did Judas have a choice? Did he choose to do this? Was he made to do this? Was he prepared to do this? Aaron, what's the answer? Is it free will or is it sovereignty or is it both? Could Judas have repented? Could he have turned away? And I, I spent much of my early Christian life debating people on sovereignty and free will and having these back and forth uh, conversations. And I've, I've realized recently that it's kind of pointless Instead, what I like to do is read to people Romans 9, 19 to 24. Instead of arguing with me, argue with the Apostle Paul, <laughs> who received direct revelation from Jesus Christ, went to the seventh heaven and saw revelation that he couldn't even utter out of his mouth. This is what Paul says about someone who Jesus calls the son of destruction. 
You will say to me, why does he still find fault, God? Who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is moulded say to its moulder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honourable use and another for dishonourable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? What did Jesus call Judas? Son of destruction. Well, Aaron, he chose that. Well, what does it say here? Whom God has prepared. Not he knew what he was going to do before he did it. Whom God has prepared as vessels of wrath for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory even us whom he has called not from the Jews only but also from the Gentiles. Judas had a role to play. He had a purpose and without him the betrayal, the cross, these things could not have taken place. It was all part of God's bigger plan. But for us, our question as humans, in our, in our very finite understanding of how these things can possibly happen, we seem to almost want to question God. Jesus, how could you say that he's a son of destruction? How could you say that you knew from the beginning but didn't say anything to him? What, what is this? How is this fair? And Romans 9 basically turns around to us and says, who are you? <laughs> who are you to question the potter, over what he does with the lumps of clay he has. It's a difficult thing to settle with, but Paul gives us no other answer apart from that. Paul doesn't tell us why, he just tells us how. Sometimes how isn't really what we're waiting for. One thing I do know, Judas was not genuine from the very beginning. He was never genuine during any part of that ministry. He was a thief and used to steal the whole entire time. And Jesus knew, but the disciples did not. Jesus said to Judas, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Jesus has no time for false humility, false godliness, false love, falsities in any way, shape or form. He just tells him, leave her alone. One person in this room is truly worshipping God, one is pretending to. One is serving God and giving to God and one is pretending to want to give to the poor. He says, leave her alone for the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Now it's an interesting line when Jesus says, you do not always have me, because he says to the Apostle Peter in a few chapters, I will be with you even until the end of the world. He says to Peter, I'll never leave you. I'll be with you forever. But there's a two point to here. When Jesus says, you will not always have me, he's not only referring to physically, because obviously he's about to ascend, but who is he replying to? Judas. He's talking to Judas. Judas, you will not always have me. Someone doesn't like my sermon. I'm only 18 minutes in. It's already gone wrong. Oh, it's all good. (laughs) I'll preach a more baby-friendly message next time. Verse 9, guys, verse 9. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Through Lazarus, through his account, many Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So I want to quickly ask, what had Lazarus done for all of these Jews to believe in him, believe in Jesus? Was he an incredible evangelist? He must have been an amazing evangelist. Was he a fantastic preacher, a fantastic teacher? Was he a great missionary? This is what Lazarus done. He got ill. He died. He woke up in a tomb, covered in grave clothes, got released from it, and then went for a meal with Jesus. And through that, 
many people are now believing in Jesus. Lazarus didn't have to evangelize anyone. He didn't have to preach to anyone. Just simply being the person whom God had done an incredible work in was leading people to Jesus. Just him living his life as someone who had been resurrected was leading people to Jesus. But I want to ask you a question. Is it any less amazing when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead physically? Is it any less amazing what the Holy Spirit does to us? Is it any less a miracle when the Holy Spirit raises a person from the dead spiritually? Is it any less a miracle when he creates in us a new person? Should we not also follow the same example of Lazarus? One of the most powerful types of evangelism you will ever have in your entire life is allowing the work of Christ to simply ooze out of your life. To be a Christian is evangelism. To follow Jesus is evangelism. To have him mould your life from the inside out, change you from the inside out, is evangelism. I love what Corinthians says about the fragrance of Christ oozing out of us, being smelt by all of those around us. Now, when they smell it, they may not necessarily like it. The Bible tells us in Corinthians that to some, the smell is, is horrible because they're going from death to death. But for some, the smell is beautiful because they're going from life to life. Lazarus' best type of evangelism was simply living out what Christ had already done in his life. But look what the response was. The chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. When they killed Jesus, realizing that their plan to destroy the light in this world had not worked, the most plausible and natural response is to kill those who follow Jesus. If you kill Jesus but it doesn't solve the problem, then the best thing to do is kill the ones Jesus now lives in. <laughs> and so their natural response to try and stop this wave of salvation from spreading across Israel was not only to kill Jesus, but was also to kill Lazarus. They wanted to kill the proof that Jesus was who he said he was. They wanted to kill the evidence. Verse 12, it says, The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. The crowd that laid down the palm trees were the same crowd that believed in Jesus through the resurrection of Lazarus. They had followed him from the feast, gone to Jerusalem and prepared the way for their coming king. Now, we're going to go through a couple of descriptions of what this crowd do as Jesus enters into Jerusalem. But I want to make sure that you understand while it is a wonderful thing they're doing for Jesus, they are doing it not really comprehending who or what or what he has come to accomplish. Okay, and I'm going to show you how, while it is beautiful, there's also misunderstanding at the core of it. The first thing is it says they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. Palm trees for Israel at this time was a sign of national pride and national conquest. We learned a couple of weeks ago about this festival of Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights. In the first and second book of Maccabees, when they rededicated the temple, guess what they laid down? Palm trees. Branches of palm trees were laid down because what it was a sign of was victory from oppression. We've driven out the mad king. We've freed ourselves from the Greek rule. Let's lay down palm leaves as a sign of victory from our oppressors. And so when they laid down branches of palm trees for Jesus, what the people were doing it for was, we're about to be set free from the Romans. He is about to deliver us from our oppressors. Now with each thing they do, there's truth mixed with misunderstanding. Jesus was about to set them free from an oppressor. He was about to come and liberate them. He was about to come and save them. But it wasn't for the, from the Romans, not even close. 
It was from sin, death, iniquity, transgression. Do you know who Jesus was coming to save them from? Themselves. He was coming to set them free from themselves, from their own sin, from their own transgressions. And obviously coming to set them free from Satan. So when they laid those palm branches out, they done so thinking one thing, not realizing it was the other. The second thing they say is, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Hosanna, we literally just sung it. I wonder how many of us sung the words not knowing what it actually means. I know that for a good four years I used to sing that song thinking, Hosanna, have no idea what the word actually means. It means save us. That's what it means. Save now. Save us. That's what Hosanna means. But once again, when the Jews are crying out, Hosanna, what they're really saying is save us from the Romans. Save us from our oppressors. They're not crying out, save us from our sins. They're crying out, save us from the physical threat we have over us. And so once again, there's truth mixed with misunderstanding. Jesus had come to save them, but not from Romans. Jesus had come to save the Romans as well, and the Gentiles and the Jews. And then lastly, they say the King of Israel. Once again, truth and misunderstanding. Jesus is the King of Israel. He's the King of the entire world. But when they said King of Israel, it was very similar to when he was feeding the 5,000 and they came to make him King. Be king over us. Take over the Romans, cast them out, rule Israel with an iron, iron hand and lead us. There was misunderstanding mixed with truth. It was a beautiful thing that was happening, but from their hearts, even at this point, a week before his death, they still did not fully comprehend what he had come to do. And it says, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Jesus here is fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah 9.9 that prophesied about this very moment taking place. That little verse, fear not, daughter of Zion, that's from Zechariah 9.9, 500 years before this moment. Jesus is also fulfilling an amazing prophecy in the, God, in the, in the book of Daniel. The, the book of Daniel prophesies to the very day that Jesus would be riding into Jerusalem on a donkey thousands of years before it happened. The angel met with Daniel and gave him an equation. And when the scholars went through the equation and came to the mathematical conclusion of it, they concluded that when they took the leap years into account, when they took all the numbers the angel gave them, it came to the exact day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. It's quite incredible that Jesus fulfilled things happening thousands of years before those moments. And I just a little conjecture from me. Do you know that all donkeys have a cross on their back? All donkeys. Every donkey has a cross on its back. Look it up. It's fact. All donkeys have a cross on their backs. Now, the world tells you that the reason the cross is there is for camouflage. And that sounds really logical because, as we know, donkeys are apex predators. And they have to stay hidden really, really well. Or they're hunted by lions and gorillas and all sorts. So those cross-shaped trees and the cross-shaped bushes really help donkeys when they stand up on hind legs and do this and hide. It really helps them a lot. Sorry, I'm being a bit facetious. But the point is, donkeys have a cross on their back for a reason. God loves to leave us, not breadcrumbs, but loaves of bread <laughs> to show us that he's there. Jesus found a young donkey. Now, for a conquering king who was coming in to take over a land, he would ride in on a war horse or a carriage led by horses, a sign of authority and power. But the donkey for Israel at this time was a sign of peace and gentleness. It wasn't a sign of power or authority. For a king to be riding a donkey was one of the most contradicting things the Israelites would have, no one would have put a king on a donkey, no one but the donkey represented peace. What peace had Jesus come into Jerusalem to achieve? It wasn't peace between humanity. It wasn't world peace as we sometimes pray for. 
It was peace between us and God. Jesus came to bring peace between creation and creator, to wipe the slate clean, to bring us back into that relationship and reconcile us back to our God. That's the peace he came to bring. And he came to bring it for the Jews, for the Romans, for the Greeks, and for all the people in the entire world. He rode on a donkey to show, I haven't come here to give you a physical kingdom. I've come to bring you into a spiritual one. I've come to bring you peace. Look what it says next. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. John has no shame in exclaiming that when he's writing this years later, we had no idea at the time. But it brings me a great deal of hope when I realise that throughout Jesus' ministry, so much of what he taught, they did not understand at the time he taught it. It brings me a great deal of hope to realise that Jesus for three years was sowing seeds and watering them that he knew wouldn't come to fruition until after his ascension, till after his cross and resurrection. He knew that and yet he taught them anyway. It says the disciples did not understand these things. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things and had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. It tells us that those who are bearing witness, those who are singing Hosanna, those who are putting down branches of palm trees, were the same crowd that had believed in him because of the resurrection of Lazarus. If we go back to last week and we ask Jesus the question, why didn't you go to Lazarus straight away? Why didn't you heal him when he was sick? Why did you let him die? Here we have the answer. Lazarus was a part of a huge plan that his illness and death was only a very small part of. But the ripples from it extended far beyond what Lazarus could possibly understand when he was going through it. Yet I take a great deal of hope in trusting the sovereign plan of God, that the ripples of what I go through may have, may have consequences and effects that I won't see until God reveals them to me in the day that I'm glorified, or if he doesn't reveal them to me at all. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. It reminds me of that verse. If God is for me, who can be against me? The Pharisees divided again amongst themselves, said there's nothing we can do that seems to stop this guy. We can see how it's progressing and progressing and progressing to the final moment where they say we've got to kill him. That's the only way we're going to stop him, is if we kill him. However, does it stop him? No. It only extends the kingdom beyond what they could possibly imagine. The fact that we're sitting here learning this right now is evidence that they stopped nothing. <laughs> that they stopped nothing. Now, you'll notice I've gone through this chapter relatively fast. And we're actually not going to go any further today than verse 26, because I believe in the next six verses are some of the most important verses I think I'll ever preach in my entire ministry. And whenever I say that, I always get a gulping feeling within, because the pressure of wanting to get it right is extreme. And the reason, when we read them, you might be thinking, really, Aaron, where's, where's the importance? But the reason there are such incredibly important verses here is because I truly believe that the gospel lies at the very heart and centre of what Jesus is about to teach us. So we're going to spend the next 20 minutes, what we've got left, on six verses by themselves in order to fully comprehend the importance of what we're about to learn. Read with me from verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip 
went and told Jesus. Doesn't seem too important so far, does it? Now, the Greeks may have gone to Philip because Philip was, in fact, the only one who had a Greek name. Philip was not a Hebrew name. It was a Greek name, and so the Greeks came to Philip instead. Philip then goes to Andrew because Andrew was one of the three who had the intimate experiences with Christ. There are at least three experiences Jesus had only with John, Peter, and Andrew. And so he was one of the three that goes with him. So Philip goes to Andrew and they both go to Jesus and say, hey, these Greeks want to speak to you. And Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. All the way through the gospel, we've heard Jesus say, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Jesus now says about five days before the crucifixion, my hour is now here. Three years before this, he had said to his mother, my hour is not yet here. Three years later, my hour is now here. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Notice it does not say the Son of Man to be crucified. Notice it does not say the Son of Man to be put to death. It is my time now for the Son of Man to be glorified. Before we go any further, I want you to understand something. The cross is not a tragedy. It's an achievement. The cross is not a tragedy. It is an achievement. It was not man's plan. It was God's plan for salvation. And the plan succeeded. It was a success. It was fulfilled. It was achieved. It was a tragedy in the sense of what he had to go through to achieve it. But the accomplishment of the cross was not a tragedy. It was an achievement by God fulfilling his plan for salvation. So Jesus doesn't say, here comes the hour for me to die. He says, here comes the hour for me to be glorified. Not only glorified in the sense of being ascended to the Father, but glorified in the sense of achieving the purposes and plans for salvation for the entire world. We cannot comprehend what must have been going through the mind of Jesus Christ in the last week as he made his way towards the cross. We cannot comprehend it, but what we do know is he walked towards it nonetheless. Now, the next verses are, for me, the ones I want to focus on. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will be my servant, where there, there will be my servant also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. Now, for now, it may seem like a bit of a riddle, but we're going to break it down. To start off with, he says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. What Jesus is referring to here is if the grain of wheat stays on the plant permanently and never leaves the plant, it's no good to anyone. It doesn't do anything. Nothing's produced from it. It just remains alone, stuck on the plant, producing nothing from itself. It's useless. It hasn't achieved anything. There's nothing which has come from it that we can have which is gain. It's just by itself. It has to fall to the ground and be transformed in order for it to bear fruit. It has to die in order for it to bear fruit. Now, there's a twofold to this. The first one is Jesus is evidently talking about himself. And you might say, well, Aaron, that's not really fair because surely even if Jesus didn't die for us, it would still be fruitful, would it? Would it be eternally fruitful? If Jesus had never come to the cross, but he had healed sick, healed blind, raised people back to life, would it have actually been fruitful? Well, Lazarus was going to die again. The blind man's going to die again. The lepers are going to die again. The deaf man is going to die again. Those who are healed from demonic possession are going to die again. And when they die, they with the rest of us will have to stand and be judged for what they've done and have no salvation and be cast into hell. 
So the fruit is what? Last what? 50, 40 years? The miracles, the signs, the gifts that Jesus displayed, that wasn't really the fruit. That was pointing towards what he came to do. That was a sign to show people I am who I am so that when the time came for him to give his life, they would believe in him and be saved. Signs and miracles aren't signs and miracles for signs and miracles sake. Signs point to something. The gifts of the body are given for a purpose. They're always given to either build up the body or lead people to Christ. And building up the body is only simply us trusting God more. So what Christ did wouldn't have been truly fruitful unless he had died on the cross and resurrected. Otherwise it just lasted a lifetime and that's pretty much it. So Jesus says, I have to first die in order to produce the fruit that I came here to produce. I have to give my life on the cross for the true fruit of salvation to be known. But there is also a second point here that is really, for me, the focus of today. He's also referring to us. If it dies, it bears much fruit. Now you might be saying, Aaron, is he really referring to us? Well, let's have a look at what he says next. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Jesus wants nothing less than for us to die and be born again. Nothing less. Matthew 16 says this, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever who would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Whoever loves his life in this world loses it. But whoever loses his life for Jesus' sake finds it. Ephesians 4.22 says, Put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. What is it to love your life in this world? If Jesus says, if you love your life, you lose it, then what is it to love your life in this world? Well, first of all, to put it very simply as an umbrella statement, it's to live a life that revolves around you. That's the first very obvious one I can bring to the table. It's to live a life where you are the centre of it. You are the epicentre of your life and this whole entire universe revolves around you. It revolves around your desires, your wants, your needs, your fleshly desires. It revolves what you want to do when you want to do it. If you're living a life where you love your life, it literally revolves completely and absolutely, you are the absolute centre of the universe. That's an umbrella statement of what it is to love your life. If we were to break it down into smaller chunks, we could talk about our daily passions, our daily desires, our daily sinful desires. To love your life is to live how you want to live. It's to do what you want to do on a daily basis. That's what it is to love your life. Another side of loving your life, and this is a very prominent side within Christianity that has to be dealt with, is thinking that you're a good person. I'm inherently good. Yeah, okay, Jesus died for a few sins I've committed, but God gave me a good heart. I'm a good person. And I love myself. Jesus died to make me a little bit better than I already am. Jesus died to make Aaron a bit more of a better Aaron than I already was. That's not the gospel. But that's how countless Christians live out the gospel. Jesus died in order for me to have my own life just a little bit better than it was before. That's a fallacy. That's a heresy. That's not Christianity. That's not the gospel. 
If that's the gospel you've believed, you have believed a false gospel. You have inherited a false salvation. And when you see Jesus, he may just say to you, get away from me, I don't know who you are. Look what Jesus says. Whoever hates... The Bible doesn't use words for the sake of it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Let's break this down. The first one I want to talk about is water baptism. What is water baptism? Well, we know from the Bible that water baptism, when we baptise in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Bible teaches that water baptism, what's taking place, is a burial. I am being buried with Christ, and when I come up out of that water, symbolically, I am being raised with him. Let me ask you, would you bury someone who's still alive? No, (laughs) hopefully. No one said no, a bit worrying. Maybe you really don't like some people, but would you bury someone who's still alive? The answer is no. You bury dead people. The only person who should be getting baptised is the person who has died. They need a funeral. They're dead. They need to be buried. I say often when I'm baptising people, welcome to this person's funeral. A miracle is about to take place. You're going to witness a funeral and a birth all at the same time. Because when they go down, they're being buried. When they come up, they're being born again, a new creation, a new life. But here's the problem, guys. Many Christians go down into that water thinking, let me take me with me. And when they come back up, they've got the misunderstanding of, I guess I'm allowed to still keep the old me with me as well. They go down into the water alive, not yet dead. They go down there still clinging on to what they had. Like Lot's wife who looked back at Sodom and Gomorrah and turned into a pillar of salt. Like the man whom Jesus says, if anyone puts his hand to the plough and looks back, he is not worthy of me. They don't get baptised wanting to completely and absolutely die and be born again. They get baptised thinking this will make my life a little bit cleaner. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. I'll put it easy to you. You cannot have both lives. It's that simple. What did Jesus say in Revelation? You are neither hot nor cold. I wish that I could spit you out of my mouth. Would it be that you were neither hot nor cold? Would it be that you were one or the other? You cannot be alive and dead. (laughs) It's either Christ who lives in me or Aaron who lives in me. I don't get to share. Jesus Jesus shares many things with us. He does not want to share your life. He wants you to die and live a new life, to be buried with Christ. The Bible teaches us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And we think, okay, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. What is it to seek first the kingdom? Okay, I'm going to serve at church and I'm going to do some charity deeds. I'm going to make sure I pray for two minutes once a day. That's seeking first the kingdom of God. But look what it says next in Luke 17. When they talk about the kingdom of God, do not say there it is or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. What is it to seek the kingdom of God? It's to seek the life of Christ within you. That Christ would take the reins, take the steering wheel, take over. That you would die and he would live through you. Now, what is it really to hate your life, which needs to be understood? If Jesus says, he who hates his life, what is it to hate your life? One of the first steps in hating our lives in this world is to know that there is nothing in me, nothing in me that is desirable or worshipable or glory, glorious, glorious, glory, whatever. 
There's nothing good in me. What is it to hate my life? How can I go down into that water no longer wanting to be the person I am is only if I understand there is nothing good in me. The Apostle Paul calls himself a wretch. He says, how could God save a wretch like me? There's a wonderful verse Jesus teaches. He says, he who is forgiven of much will love much. But he who is forgiven of little will love little. Now the truth is, every human being on the planet needs to be forgiven of much. There's not one human being who needs to be forgiven of little. But here's the point Jesus is making. The person who goes down into that water, realising what they've been saved from, realising who they were before, realising just how desperately sick and in need of salvation they are, they will love and serve Jesus in an incredibly devoted way. Because they owe everything to Jesus. They owe everything to him. But the person who thinks, I've been forgiven of a little, but I wasn't that bad. What's the cross to you then? That sacrifice won't mean that much. His blood won't mean that much. His body won't mean that much. You might look at other people and say, man, they really need salvation. But as for me, I'm kind of okay. But here's the thing. You'll serve Jesus with that mindset in the way that you serve him will be reflection of that mindset. The way you serve Jesus, the way you love Jesus, the way you're devoted to Jesus will be very much reflected in your understanding of how badly you needed saving. Of how badly you needed saving. What else is it to hate your life in this world? It's to be like the bond servant who pierces his ear and says, I don't want to do what I want to do anymore. I want to do what you want me to do. I don't trust my own heart. I don't trust my own mind. I don't even trust my own morals. I want to completely and absolutely do only what you want me to do on an hourly, secondly, minute basis. I don't want Aaron to live anymore. I want Christ to live through him. That's what it is to hate your life, to not want what the world wants, to want what God wants to not want what your flesh wants, but to want what God wants. This is true transformation. Now, baptism we know is symbolic, but please don't misunderstand me when these things are real as well. This is not a symbolic lesson. This is real. The Holy Spirit really changes people. The spiritual death that happens really happens, and the spiritual resurrection really happens. The new heart that God places actually gets placed and the new mind of Christ actually comes in and the spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead actually does come and live within your very bodies. I am not a symbolic preacher. This is all airy-fairy stuff. This is real life. This stuff happens. <laughs> Die and be born again. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, nearly at the end, but two very big implications here. The first very big implication is what we are talking about today is the main reason that people do not come to faith. This is the real reason why people don't give their lives to Jesus. They may have lots of other things in front of it to hide it, but what we're about to discuss can often be, for many people, the real root cause of why they don't become Christians. In John 12, 42, it says this, Nevertheless, many of the authorities believed in Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. It goes on to say they cared more about the glory they received from this world than they did from heaven. I want to make something clear. It is possible, it is possible for someone to say, Aaron, I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Bible. I believe in everything you're saying, but not be saved. And that's because the book of James tells us there are two types of faith in this world. 
living and dead. The book of James tells us even the demons believe. Demons believe in God. Of course they do. They can't deny that he's real. Are they saved? No. It's dead faith. The reason I think this is so crucial, I have met so many people in my life, close family, friends, I think even of my own brothers. I remember sitting in a car with one of my brothers and him turning around, we were on a journey to Cornwall, it was about three hours long, and my brother turned to me and I believe what he said. He said, Aaron, I believe what you're saying. I know what you're saying is true. I know that Jesus is truly God. I know that he did come down and die. He spoke to me in the car and I got excited. I was like, oh my goodness, my brother's becoming a Christian while I'm driving a car. He said to me, I know that God is real and that the Bible is true. I know it's all true. But here's the point. He didn't want to die. He loved his own life too much. He knows it's true, but he also knows what he has to give up himself. He doesn't want to die. And so while there is faith there, it's dead faith. Living faith leads to obedience. Living faith leads to good works that can be shown and proven. Now I pray and hope for my brother that he comes to a point where he is really, he is ready to die, to give his own life up. But he's in that age, so many teenagers, so many teenagers, he's in that age where to be a Christian means all that restriction and rules and commandments and Jesus wouldn't let me do this and Jesus wouldn't me do, let me do that. I don't want to be celibate and wait till marriage. I don't want to give up getting drunk on the weekends. I don't want to give up doing this and doing that. They see Jesus purely as a commandment giver and not as a saviour. So that even when someone genuinely looks at me in the eye and says, Aaron, I know that everything you're preaching is true. But what they're really saying to me is this. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I love my life too much. I pray and hope that God brings him to a place that he hates his life. In order that he can find true life in Jesus Christ. So many people I have met with that same problem, with that same dilemma of not wanting to lose their life. But there is a second application, not for unbelievers, but for Christians. I have conversations with many Christians talking to me on a weekly basis saying, Aaron, I want to bear fruit. I want to be fruitful. Aaron, I can't see the fruit in my life. And if I can see it, it's not enough. How can I be more fruitful, Aaron? Well, What does Jesus say? If it dies, it bears much fruit. It goes back to the story Jesus says about those who are forgiven of much will love much. Those who are forgiven of little will love little. It goes also to the saying where Jesus says it is harder for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. There are a lot of Christians in this world dragging behind them their old life, doing their best to live both at the same time, wanting to raise the dead man while trying to live as the new, wanting to follow Jesus, but only as far as they want to, wanting to follow Jesus, but still wanting to kind of live their own life, still wanting to do what they want to do. Kind of, Lord, I'll obey you in this and this and this, but leave this and this and this alone. Lord, I give you my marriage, but leave my wallet. (laughs) Lord, I give you my wallet, but leave my marriage alone. Lord, I give you Sundays, but leave Monday to Saturday. Or Lord, I give you Saturday and Sunday, but leave Monday to Friday for me to do what I want. Jesus asks for nothing less. He did not come to have 10% of your life, 20% of your life, 40% of your life. Jesus died for 100% of your life. He died so that we could be buried with him and born again a new life, a new creation. When the Apostle Paul teaches, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Please notice what he says first. It is no longer I who live. His desires have died. 
His aspirations have died. His wants have died. What he wants to live has died. His life is dead. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's not just the Apostle Paul, guys. That's us as well. Do you want to bear fruit for the kingdom of God? You want to be fruitful children? You want to be fruitful soldiers? You want to be fruitful? Die. Take the areas of your life that you are still holding on to and submit them to the cross of Christ, bury them with him and have them raised again after his desires, his wants. Weigh and test your own life and ask yourself, what am I still clinging on to? What have I not yet given over? What is not yet dead? Is there anything in my life that I am still trying to live? That I have not fully submitted to Christ and said, live through me? Anything whatsoever, from hobbies to jobs, to aspirations, to passions, to desires... It's not a bad thing for you to have dreams and desires. It's a terrible thing if those dreams and desires come above Christ. It's a beautiful thing if you submit them to Christ and say, this is what I want, but I care more that you have what you want through me. So whether you give me my desires or not, your grace is sufficient for me. The life of Christianity is not, thank you, Jesus, for making my life better. The life of Christianity is, thank you, Jesus, for burying my old life and for giving me a whole and completely new one. Jesus does not make you a better person. Jesus changes who you are. He doesn't take Emma and say, I'm going to make a better Emma. He says, I'm going to make a new Emma. Take John and say, I'll make a better John. No, I'll make a new John. The old John's buried and dead. I'm going to make a new one. A new creation. The question has to be, have we died? Do we hate our lives for the sake of Christ? Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It is no longer I who live. I'll go back to my original statement. The world no longer revolves around you. The world now revolves around Christ. Is there any part of your life where your world still revolves around you? Any part whatsoever. If there is, bring it to Jesus, bury it at the cross, and devote it completely and absolutely to the Lord. It sounds extreme. I would even be called by some a radical preacher, radical Christian. I tell you what, I'd much rather be a radical Christian and preach the truth than be a normal Christian and preach watered-down Gospels that change absolutely nothing. Because it tells you, you're fine how you are. Jesus just came to make you a little bit better. The Gospel says, we're wretches, evil from birth, sinners, lost, warped, deceived. And we need nothing else but to be completely and absolutely restored, saved, washed clean and created anew again, a new creation. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. No wonder the other gospels don't offend people because it's not the true gospel. This is the gospel that people hear and they either rejoice at because there's a way for them to be born again, to be changed, or they either hear it and are greatly offended because you're telling them they'll never be good enough. Christianity is the only religion on the entire world, the only 
the only belief system in the entire world that preaches this. From Hinduism to Muslims to Sikhs, every other religion preaches some sort of works-based salvation. If you're a good enough Muslim, if you're a good enough Catholic, if you're a good enough Hindu, even if you're a good enough Hindu, you'll be reincarnated as this. If you're good enough anything, if you're good enough as you are, Christianity is the only faith in the world that says you will never be good enough. So I sent my perfect son to die for you, who is good enough, in order to create in you a new person. The only faith in the entire world that says something as drastic as that. That God had to die for his creation. To finish off, he carries on, If anyone serves me, he must follow me. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. You are not really able to serve Jesus without following him. You're not able to follow him without serving him. They go hand in hand. But I want to make something clear. The service he's talking about, is it serving in worship, hospitality, bring and share, preaching? Is that the service God's talking about? Absolutely not. The service Jesus is talking about is how you follow him on a second-by-second -second basis throughout the week. The service that Jesus is talking about is your private life. Are you the same Monday to Saturday as you are in this church? Are you as devoted to Jesus Monday to Saturday as you are when you're here? That's the service Jesus is talking about. Worship, hospitality, bring and share. These things are fantastic. They're brilliant. But they should only ever be the overflowing of what's already taking place Monday through to Saturday. My preaching should only ever be the overflowing of my relationship with Jesus Monday to Saturday. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Please just hear what I just said, what Jesus just said. And where I am, my, there I will be also. There my servant will be also. If you encounter a servant of Jesus Christ, Jesus is there. Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, is here with us right now. If we are indeed servants of the Most High, the Most High is here in this room. And I just want to say, praise you, Lord Jesus, our King and Lord. And where I am, there will be my servant also. We may not be able to see him right now. One day we will be able to see him, but please do not mistake it. He is here right now. And lastly, he says, if anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. God the Father sees the service and honours. I want to make just one thing very crystal clear. God does not honour the one who serves for the sake of being seen. And God does not honour the one who serves for the sake of being heard. He honours the one who serves him with the genuine heart of wanting to please him. I wonder sometimes how many Christians will get to heaven to get their reward and God will say, what, what reward? You've had it already. You had it when you told someone what you were doing. You had it when you told someone how much you had been doing for the Lord. You had it when you done this and done that and made sure that your works were seen by everyone. You've already had your reward. There's nothing here for you. But bring forth the person who did it in secret. Bring forth the person who didn't let their left hand know what their right hand was doing. Bring forth the person who kept it from everyone, knowing that their father in secret sees it. Let them receive the reward I have for them. Just be aware. Don't share your righteousness among others for the sake of being seen doing so. Because you do instantly lose your reward in heaven. <laughs> instantly. Matthew 6, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say, they have received their reward. When you pray, you must not be like hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the street corners and the synagogues, that they may be seen by others. They have received their reward. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, they have received their reward. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moss and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where they can never be taken and moss cannot take away. 
God honours those who serve him with the genuine and right motive and heart. It's a good thing, it's difficult, but it's a good thing to let your service be done in secret between you and the Father. It's a good thing. It's something that God honours and he instructs us to do. So what is the application to this sermon? What is the application? Well, I think if you don't know by now, (laughs) I, I must have done a really bad job. The application is for us as Christians to take our lives and to have a bit of a sit down and to weigh and test how much of our lives, what areas of our lives are we still trying to live? How much of our lives still revolve around us and how much of them revolve around Christ? For some, for some who hear this sermon, it will be a question of have I died at all? And that's a question you need to ask yourself. For some, it will be an area of, I need to die in these areas and be born again. I need the life of Christ to come into these areas, to change these areas. Less like Aaron, more like Christ. Less like Haley, more like Christ in these areas. Sorry, love. You're almost perfect. You're almost perfect. I can't say you're perfect, but you're almost there. This sermon is an invitation. It's an invitation to life. But the way to get there is called Jesus Christ, and he requires nothing less than death. If you have been buried with Christ and raised again with him, then live your life according so. Live your life like that. That you have been buried, that it's no longer you who lives, but it's he who lives in you. Give up everything and ask Jesus to show you, to guide you, to lead you. The Bible says, count the cost before building the house. And for those of you who haven't yet given their lives to Christ, for those of you who are still on the outside of the house looking in, Jesus doesn't ask you to die for death's sake. He asked you to die so that he may show you what life was actually meant to be. He asked you to die to reveal to you the life he has for you. I'll give you a very short testimony to finish. And I don't like to speak about myself too much. I hope that's true. If it's not, please come and speak to me. (laughs) But just a short testimony. When I was baptised at 21, I knew nothing. I don't think I'd ever even picked up a Bible, if I was being honest. Maybe in Sunday school when I was a kid, I'd gone there for like one or two years. But I knew nothing. I knew nothing of the Bible. I couldn't quote to you verses. I didn't fully understand God. I didn't understand really even what Jesus had done. I knew nothing when I was baptised. I only knew one thing. One, when I was in that water. I don't want to be who I am anymore. I don't want this life anymore. I had heard the voice of God weeks earlier tell me, that he had a life for me that I couldn't possibly imagine. I heard him tell me that if you give your life to me, I will show you what life is really about. And when I got in that water, while I knew nothing, all I did know was when I go down into this water, I want to die. And when I come back up, I want to be a new person. I don't want to be Aaron anymore. I want to be the Aaron you want me to be. The Aaron you create. The new Aaron. I knew nothing apart from I hated my life. And I can tell you assuredly that in the seven years since I was buried with Christ, Jesus has shown me in abundance what life is really about. I have a baby on the way a beautiful wife, a pastor of a church. If you had looked at me seven years ago, you would have been like, that guy is so done for. Jesus has given me the life he wants me to have. And so now I place my life in his hands. I made a pretty bad job of it for 21 years. So why on earth would I think that I can try and make a good job of it now? I can't. All I know is the second Jesus took it, he changed it and transformed it in ways I couldn't even begin to imagine were possible. 
And I'm not just talking about big things like a wife or a baby. I'm talking about the intricacies of my life. I'm talking about addictions. I'm talking about sins. I'm talking about things that I never thought I'd be free from, that I was free from overnight because I hated my life and I gave it for the sake of Christ. The question I have for you today is, do you love your life? Or do you desire the life Christ can give you? You get to choose. It's either your life or Christ's life. You cannot have both. Which one do you love more? That's the choice. I made my choice. You make yours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, at the beginning of this year, I prayed a prayer for maturity in this church. I prayed a prayer, Lord, asking for you to mature us, for you to bring us into maturity and godliness. Lord, I, I feel that this is definitely a milestone in that maturity. Father, I pray for the hearts and minds of all of my brothers and sisters and all of those who are here today who don't know you. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal to them the areas of their life that they have not yet died. I pray you'd reveal to them any areas of their life that they still love and are clinging to. I pray, Lord, for those who have not yet been given the life that you have for them, that you're waiting to give them, that they would realise that their life is not even close, not even close to being as good as what you have in store for them. I pray, Lord, that they would trust that the best possible path for us is what you want for us. Lord, bring us into maturity. Bring us into maturity and understanding that we must first die in order to bear fruit. We must first die in order to know life in Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Father, that you didn't make me a little bit better, but I thank you, Father, that you made me a new creation altogether. I thank you that you did it for my brothers and sisters, and I pray you would do it for those here who still have not had that, Lord. Help us, please, Heavenly Father. Change us, please, Heavenly Father. Forgive us, please, Lord God, if we have kept anything from you, if we have fought against you trying to keep something that belongs to you. Your word tells us that you have purchased us by your blood. We no longer belong to ourselves. <coughs> but we belong solely and wholly to you. May we live lives that show that, Heavenly Father. Help us, Lord. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.